Hello, so this week I was um, discussing uh, sanitizers. I went into a bit about uh, paging and virtual memory just to make some people understand. But, you know, hopefully we can remember from the first two weeks that I was talking a lot about instrumentation. So you have, um, you know, graphs, essentially. Graph is basically, you know, two components in the simplest form. You have some sort of circle or a vertex or a node. And you have, you know, maybe another circle. And you have these things connecting these circles or nodes or vertexes, whatever you want to call them. Um, a bit like this. And, you know... This can be program flow, so this can be, you know, a main function. This can be a print function. This can be an error function. This can be a success function. If you've ever seen things like, you know, IDA and how that disassembles, you get this, you know, but they're blocks. So you've got your edges or your uh, paths or your connections. And you've got your vertexes or your nodes. Um, so what I said, you know, the first week about AFL and, you know, talking about Clang and Hong fuzz is that you have these nodes and then as execution sort of so each 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 node here is essentially a decision point number one will the program execute in this direction or will the program execute in this direction and you know these are governed by comparison statements like cmp within the assembly itself or more typically if statements or switch statements case statements loops for loops while loops in the actual program code but this is all they represent underneath the assembly says you know if the certain condition gets met, then go down this path, or if the certain condition gets met, go down this path. Now, so you can actually trace programs by, like I said, previous two weeks, you know, you, you write a little bit of code here and these paths here, and maybe this path and this path, you know, and this path, and what happens is that, you know, it's like a little flag, it's a little alert system. It's whenever execution goes down this path, we trigger this, this little red alert here, and when we trigger this red alert, we're able to detect that it's actually gone down this path. We trigger the thread alert. It's gone down this path. Then we can record this as like one single trace. I said that about AFL just so people can understand last week. Now, what I wanted to talk about this week was um, sort of a bit of the way I first. I'm going to briefly talk about sanitizers, but it sort of goes into, like I said, you know, virtual memory and um, you know things like paging. Well, that paging actually means sort of under the hood. Um, again, I play fast and loose with the terminology because, in my eye, in, you know, in my eyes, like intuition is far more important. But the first thing to say is, right, you know, we've got a fuzzer. It does this instrumentation stuff. The entire job of a fuzzer is to take some test case, some random bit of data, you know, whether or not it's a malform JPEG or malform PNG or malform web request. You know, we generate this malform request. We push it through the program. So this is the program under test or um, the system under test. So we have, you know, it goes through the system under test. You know, does it crash? If it doesn't crash, record if it generated a new path. If it generated a new path, we'll keep that for later and we'll go back over it later and look more closely and generate new test cases. So, you know, that's what it's doing is it's constantly doing this loop, seeing if it crashes. Now, the thing is with, you know, a lot of bugs is that when we're doing it in sort of originally in this case is that you will, you can have bugs that won't crash the program. And a really classic one of this is, you know, Heartbleed. Um, it would, you know, you had some sort of buffer. You know, let's just draw it quickly. So, you know, there was a there was a web server on the right hand side here, right? There was a client on the, you know, this side. Let's just sort of server and client. You know, the client would send a, I think it was TLS heartbeat, if I remember, in an Apache Apache module. You know, it would send this heartbeat to the server, and the server would respond. You know, with whatever data. You know, one one one, whatever data was sent, and it would you know respond with you know one one one. So the server, you know, all it sees is it gets some data and it just responds with that data. And the client says, "Oh, that's the same data I sent. Therefore, I know it's still there. The server's up and working." Now there's a bug in this where, if you specified within the data packet here, so in this case we've only sent three ones, but typically you get what's called um, things like type length value parsing is a really typical one, or you know protocols have this notion of how big something is. So we send a bit of data, we only send three characters, and we tell the server we actually sent 300 characters. The, ser the mistake was is that the server didn't turn around and go, hang on a minute, you're saying that you've sent me 300 characters, but you've only sent me three characters. It didn't do that, it just sent, it just believed whatever the client would say. So it would turn around and send, you know, I send three characters. It says, you know, it's a size of 390, sorry, 300 characters long. So the server sends me back 297 characters back. Now, what that had in, you know, in like the heap memory is you had 
some buffer and at the beginning here you know this was the three characters let's just say one 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 that we sent to the you know if we sent from the client to the server that was the thing in this this remember this is in server's memory this is in the server's memory and you know we send these one two three bytes in one 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 and we tell the server actually we sent 300 bytes so what the server does is it reads beyond its buffer and heap memory whatever memory it was and it actually sends back all of this junk in here now most of this junk in here would just be completely unreadable gibberish it'll be memory addresses old stack values and whatever but now and again you would start getting things like people's passwords and you know people's secret keys out of this so if you know two people use a server at the same time like you log on to your banking website and you know one person puts in their password and another person puts in their password if you use this bug you could potentially read out the other person's password so that was what heartbleed was really bad for and i'll make the point about heartbleed is because Generally, this type of overread behavior won't crash the process. Like, it's not overwriting memory. It's not causing, like, a huge amount of corruption. But it's still a massive bug. Like, it's still, like, you know, almost serious S10, right? Because you're actually reading people's passwords and people's, you know, keys out to, to a point that people actually dedicate, give it a name, Heartbleed, and they, you know, created a website for it. So I just wanted to make that point that, you know, AFL's entire job, at least in the first instance, you know, you chuck in a test case, you run it through the program, trace the execution and see if it can crash. And it either does crash or it doesn't crash or it gets in an infinite loop. And you know, with other cases, you know, it's, it's very, very typical with um, memory leaks. As you know, a memory leak might only occur after five minutes, but AFL only records something for up to, you know, a fraction of a second. So, you know, it, it, there might be a memory leak that's sort of building within this program, but you won't necessarily know about it for, you know, five more minutes. But by the time this one execution's run and stops, AFL doesn't know and it doesn't cause a crash, so AFL doesn't know there's a problem. But there still is legitimately a bug, right? Denial of service bug. So the idea is, is that these things called sanitizers were created, and it sort of was a bit like, you know, if anyone's ever used Valgrind, sort of, or still uses Valgrind, it doesn't just try and detect, you know, whether or not there's a crash. It tries to detect if there's actually an error occurred in the program. Now, the big one that you see a lot of the time is what's called a dress sanitizer, um, you'll see it as A-S-A-N for Address Sanitizer. And you can turn this on um, with the compiler. I'll show you, actually. It's probably better if I, uh, if I just switch to my screen and show you of how you turn this on. If I just quickly find some code to build. If I just go to temp, obviously, there's nothing, nothing here. So I'll just write a quick program. Uh, Test.c, because that's my favorite. Include stdi.h. do this right do nothing just return zero let's compile that test.c dash output test i hope this works so that compiles where so we can turn the sanitizer on by type typing you know dash f and more options sanitize equals address you can you can specify more options you can specify things like you know leak if you really wanted to obviously uh, gcc doesn't support this other compilers may support it but you can turn on um different sanitizers by uh, using this behavior and then you hit enter although i san it i can't spell san it ties equals address there we go it's compiled it's leak work there we go leak works now i can turn on multiple sanitizers so you know in this instance we've turned on you know the address sanitizer we've turned on the leak sanitizer now in my really simple process it's not it's not really going to cause an issue um, but that's sort of how you do it. Remember, remember that's the command. If I just sort of scroll back just to show you. Remember, that's the command for you to turn address sanitizer on. You can add more by putting a comma on the end. And this works for things like Clang. It works for things like GCC. Um, Clang generally has more support and is a bit better at it than um, GCC. But that's, you know, par for the course, frankly. Anyway, I was talking about this thing, this this idea. So, so the way, so what I do when I come to actually fuzzing stuff is the first thing I will always do is I will first run the fuzzer without any sanitizers on it because at the end of the day you know if i run a fuzzer and it crashes because of a memory corruption bug then it's a pretty major bug like it's actually crashed you know it's actually had a memory corruption bug in it now a sanitizer you know won't will will still crash on those bugs i'm not trying to say it won't crash on those bugs but it will also crash on more minor bugs so what i typically do in the first instance is you know run the fuzz test without that f sanitizer dr equals address on it and then after a while, I will, you know, stop it if it finds nothing. And then I'll turn the, you know, I'll turn the address sanitizer on and I'll fuzz it again to see if it finds stuff. Now, the sanitizers will make it slightly slower. 
um, but they will find more bugs and they are legitimate bugs like it's little memory overreads most of them probably won't cause an issue but you know now and again you get these you know these heart bleed type things that you won't be able to detect otherwise so that's sort of how i use sanitizers one thing you've got to be aware of um, <laughs> with sanitizers that can be very 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 annoying is that um, if i just demonstrate this actually really quickly so if i just rewrite this program uh, obviously Vim, because Vim is the best. And I just create on song. I create a buffer called T. I don't know if 20. I can't even write 20. I'll just you know make it equal nothing. Uh, I create another buffer, let's say of uh, say of 19 for instance. Just uh, include mem copy. And what I'm going to do here, you know, I'll explain it for people that don't understand, but all I'm going to do is I'm going to copy something, actually I need to rename that TNS. I'm going to copy something in to the S buffer from the T buffer, and I want to carry, you know, copy 20 characters. So mem copy or memory copy copies memory from this buffer T to, you know, this buffer S. I should probably actually rename it. Uh, because this is actually what it is, so we'll just call this the dest, dest um, source, rename it, uh, dest, actually no, yeah, dest, no, it's on source, isn't it, and dest, just to make it a bit clearer. So, you know, we've created two buffers. We've created a buffer that's 20 bytes big called source, and a buffer that's 19 bytes big called, you know, dest. Well, this isn't going to cause a crash, probably, like there's probably enough junk on the memory. It is going to cause a one byte overflow, right? Because there's a discrepancy there and we're overwriting one byte into that region. So, you know, I, you know, recompile this uh, without the sanitizer. Run it. Oop. Doesn't crash as expected. However, if I read, put, if I put the sanitizer on, you know, it doesn't cause a crash inherently, but I, you know, run, run the uh, sanitizer. It actually causes a crash, um, and I explained before about what all these things mean. You know, it says it's a stack buffer overflow. It's a right size of twenty at this point. If you had dash g on, if I just recompile with dash g, which uh, does it with source code, um, it will say that it's occurred at line nine in main. So I can actually look at you know I can read this temp c at line nine. So if I just go to you know temp c line nine, you know it says it's happened to the mem copy. So we know that. It will also do it for, um, for for reads and writes. So, you know, if I, you know, decrease this buffer by 19 and, you know, I increase this by 20, if I just recompile it quickly and, you know, I come up here and I go, I haven't, I haven't run it again, remember? So the first one was a write size of 20, so it knows that. You know, and I run it again. Crashed again. But this time it's a read size of 20, so it's able to pick that up. It can pick up things like use after freeze, double freeze. It can pick up, um, you know, I've uh, got loads of, loads of different stuff. Stack overflows, heap overflows, um, leaks, you know, le leak access issues. It can detect a whole bunch of stuff. It can detect, even detect things like race conditions, if you like, if you play your cards right, really, and sort of really, you know, intuitively understand it. Well, that's essentially what the sanitizer does. Uh, what's really annoying about this, though, is because the fuzzer picks up smaller bugs, what you typically find happening is, you know, you'll, you'll let's say this is a program, and this is a program that's got a bunch of bugs in it, you know. If it's bad software, I'd expect a few major bugs in there and lots and lots of little ones. So this is why I don't run the sanitizer straight away. So let's say, you know, we've got two bugs in here, this one and this one, the, you know, full-on, you know, stack overflow bugs that, you know, will allow us to write a full-on, you know, remote code execution exploit. However, there's also, you know, a few other smaller bugs as I've drew, drew in the triangles here that, you know, won't crash the program, but if the sanitizer is enabled, will crash it. So if, you know, let's say I started this with the sanitizer on, you know, I fuzzed it, it would, you know, it would crash on these bugs here. Now, eventually, after enough time, you know, and we fixed all of these small bugs before we get to these big bugs, remember, because the execution flow in this case goes from top to bottom. We first need to fix all these little bugs, which, you know, may not actually be that bad before we can figure out these bad bugs. Now, the way you want to approach the situation is fi fix the worst things first. 
So what I do is I fuzz without the sanitizers to not trigger these smaller bugs. You know, trigger these bigger bugs if they exist. Not saying they do, but you know, to give a better effort to trigger these, but but or big, bigger likelihood to trigger these bugs. And then after that's done and those big bugs are fixed, rerun the fuzzer, and then you should see a lot of these other things pop out. But that's the sort of uh, general um, method I take. Now the other thing I explain with these notes is I sort of started going into the the notion of virtual memory. So the first thing I said, and you know, sorry for you know any electronic engineers out here, but I just wanted to make people sort of grasp the concept a little bit. There's a RAM chip, you know, or a RAM card or slot or whatever. It's nothing more. If you just imagine it, as you know, really complex. This is me just drawing it simply. Is you know, it's like it's just a cube of memory cells, right? We've got, or you know, let's just draw it as a square as memory cells. If you go down to um, the uh, National Historical Computer Museum down near Bletchley Park. They've actually physically got something that looks like this there, so you can actually see it. And what it's got is it's got all of these wires that go through it, and it's got these little magnets in the middle that, when energised, will either represent a 1 or a 0. Now, obviously, like, they're really big and it doesn't store much memory, but it, it serves to, you know, teach the concept. So, you know, we've got some square here. This is a RAM chip. And this, you know, let's say I want to make this position here, let's say it's a zero, but I want to, you know, swap it to a one, I want to store a one there. What I would do is I would put a voltage on this line here, right, for instance, and then I would put another voltage on this line here. And where they cross is the place that, you know, will actually have enough energy to flip the zero to a one. It's like just like a flip flop, it changes from a zero to a one and a one to a zero. And, you know, I can do this all over the chip, but this is physically, really fundamentally, what your RAM actually is doing. You know, far more complicated than what I'm saying, but, you know, conceptually, this is what it's doing. Is you have, you know, some sort of lines down here. So let's say this is, I drew down here, I said this was, you know, this, the, this line here was one. That's one. And then this line up here on the side is three. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, so three. So, you know, I want to modify this here. So I go along here and I go, oh, that's on address line one you know, let's say crossed with address line three. So, you know, where it meets, that says which bit I'm flipping or which byte I'm flipping, whatever. And it turns out that, you know, in this case, what I'm saying is it would be, you know, address line zero X one three, right? So that's the actual address of that in the RAM. So that's, you know, and you've got a CPU over here that's connected to these address lines and the data lines and a bunch of other really complex stuff in the middle. But fundamentally, that's what you're doing. So, but, but the notion of this here, when you're like physically flipping bits and bytes in the actual RAM, this is what I call physical addressing because you're physically changing the bits. So let's have a look at this. So like back in back in day with you know computers that as big as houses, this is sort of the way it was done. Um, presented a few problems. So the first one is you know when we want to run a program, this program has to be loaded. Like it used to be tape. You used to physically just insert tape or punch cards into the machine, and you know the machine would read it. And it would place it at a certain place in, you know, RAM. Because that was what your physical drive, right? This tape was your physical hard drive. But either way, feed it into the machine and it would read it in and it would place it at a certain position. And, you know, each of these programs would have a different position they'd expect to run. So if I wanted to run these three programs at the same time, well, they couldn't run in the same memory location because they'd be on top of each other. And you can't have that because, you know, this you've got to have pre-allocated spaces. So I say for the first time, you know, this first program I load at 0x00, the second program I load at 0x10, and this third program I load at 0x60, right? Let's say it's 256 bytes of memory, goes from 0 to 0xff in hexadecimal. So, you know, that was all well and good for a while, but then some sort of problems started occurring. Um, just sort of come here. So the first one, if I just draw it, the issue is, is that, you know, number one, what happens if you accidentally load two programs at the same time? Well, they can't run at the same time, but then that means that you have this problem, and obviously you can only run so much stuff in memory, but now you need to maintain a really big list of, you know, if you get multiple developers around the world developing for this particular, you know, pro processor, like it's like a PDP or something, PDP, I think it's PDP 11, really, it's old, but not that old. And, you know, you have these things, you have to like have a really big list of like where each program is running in memory, right? And you go, oh, well, this program here. And then each time you want to write a new program, you've got to go through this list and check that it's, you know, there's not something already might exist there. So, you know, you've got to maintain this. But the other problem is, is that, you know, even if you don't choose to run the software, you can't run anything in that location because, you know, it's reserved for this. So, you know, 
I've got two different programs that the developers say I want to run it, you know, started at 0x00 and 0x00 in memory. You know, so what do you do? Um, well, it turns out the way that they solve this problem is you have two different concepts. So that, you know, the first one, if I, you know, just think back to that chip that I was discussing before, but the first one was physical memory. It's just that little sort of like RAM, you know, that square RAM chip I drew before, right? So you, you separate it into what's called physical memory. So the first thing is, is, you know, let's say we, again, we have two pro processors that want to be loaded into the same location in memory. What actually happens is, you know, when we're loading it up at the bottom and it goes to the CPU, is instead of hard coding, well, we can actually still hard code it, but instead of, you know, always physically putting, you know, these processes in the same location of memory, what happens down here is as it goes through the CPU, the CPU actually doesn't respect where this wants to go in the physical memory. What it does instead is it chops it up and places it and, ha you know, it places it somewhere else in memory and picks where it wants to go. So, you know, this red one here, even though it wants to be loaded at 0x00, the MMU or the uh, memory management unit in the CPU says, actually, I'm going to put you at 0x10 in the physical RAM, you know, and then I'm going to put you at 0x00, this one in 0x00, and it also has a list of that. And as it goes through, it says, you know, I'm going to store you at this location, I'm going to store you at this location. But when the important bit is when presented, you know, onto the actual, into the processor itself or the process itself, it still thinks it's at 0x00, not where it really is, which is 0x10 in physical RAM. And this translation as it goes to physical memory at the top to virtual memory at the bottom, call this virtual memory, this pretend memory, because it's not actually there, is done by this MMU in the CPU. And that's a lot more complicated than what I'm saying, but this is the basic concept. And it's really good because no longer do developers have to worry about where they actually physically put their programs because the, the CPU will just do it as and when and however it likes. It will just chop it up and it will say, well, I'm going to put you here and I'm going to put you there, which means we don't have to worry about it. And, you know, it solved a really, really big problem. Now, so that was the one of the first things that happened. The second one... Um, to make it a bit easier to manage again is what was called paging. And now there's a few different things I drew in here, but this is essentially what it is. Is let's say we've got on the right hand side, we've got two programs. We've got the program in the black, let's just call that program one and the program two in the green here. You know, when I when the processor actually loads stuff into physical memory, it doesn't appear to this on the virtual memory. So we've got virtual memory member goes to the MMU. We've still got that big list of where programs go. But you know, in our virtual memory space, it looks like a really big contiguous block if you know the green process or a big continuous block with the black process what it does is it chops it typically into 496 bytes so you have you know a program that's you know 10 meg big or whatever and it chops it up into 496 496 what well, bigger than that maybe 16 496 496 496 big chunks and then you know another chunk so this first one has one two three four chunks the second process has one, two, three chunks. So what we do then is what the actual processor does is as it's loading this into memory, you know, let's say it put, puts the first chunk at the first location of physical memory. Fine. Takes the second chunk of the first process, puts it into this chunk in physical memory. And let's say something happens, you know, in the middle of it. I'm not saying this will occur in this exact way, but in the middle of it, the second process actually wants to put you know, the, its chunk into memory. So it loads that at, you know, this location of memory. But as you can see, you know, it goes from one, two, three, and we've got this other green chunk in the middle, or this, you know, of the second process. And then again, we revert back to the first process. We load number three into that location. And then again, we carry on with, the, you know, the next process, which is number two, and then four, and then three from the different processes. But the important bit is, is what we're doing is we're chopping this, this main process into individual pages or chunks as they're called and we're loading them into memory it makes it a bit easier for sort of managing so we don't have to move as much data around at once um, but it also presents a really other useful feature that i'll discuss in a minute well, remember paging is you typically chop into 496 bytes doesn't need to be um, and you know as you're loading stuff in the physical memory from virtual memory you're going for the mmu and the mmu is managing all this it's not it's relocating where you know the phys virtual memory physically goes in the physical memory it's keeping a list of it but it's also breaking it apart as it does it now this presents a really really useful thing that we can do as well so because these things aren't really big let's say that you know in one two let's say the third chunk or the third page of the first process the black one here you know we're not using it very often we don't actually need to access it very often 
So what the C, what the you know what the operating system decides is well actually you, you know you only use this maybe like once every hour maybe it's just some sort of like timer email function. So what it does is it takes this chunk of memory here and it actually puts it on a hard drive. So this is what so this this entire process here on the right hand side is what we call paging, breaking memory apart and loading it in sort of as and when willy nilly. So that's called um, paging. You know this whole idea of this you know translation process down here. This is this is virtual memory, but this bit here where we choose which chunk is being utilized very often and we place it into a hard drive, that's called what's paging to disk. Now, most people, when I say paging, is they only think of this bit here, like they think of this small, you know, you've you take a page and page to disk, but it's actually called, you know, page to disk. So you've already got to have this notion of paging in the first instance. Cool. Oh, so that was paging in virtual memory really quickly. So, so this present, I explain this because it presents a bit of a problem. So when you load the process, it thinks it's got access to, you know, if it's a 32-bit program, you know, 2 to 32 big, which is around about 4 gig. This is, you know, a big limitation with 32-bit um, um, operating systems and CPUs. They can only have up to about 4 gig of memory. Um, when you have 64-bit of memory, you're getting into the hundreds of terabytes, maybe bigger. I don't know the exact number. But the problem is, is now, you know, these sanitizers, what they do is they're actually supposed to be able to map out this virtual memory. So they, they need to be able to sort of holistically look at this virtual memory and see what's going on. So what the process does is, you know, it runs as and when, but this, you know, this on the right-hand side where you've got the sanitizer, it operates in virtual memory. So what actually happens, because it's operating in virtual memory, is it actually thinks it's got access to, you know, let's say potentially 128 gigabytes or whatever it is, terabytes of, uh, of RAM. Now doesn't necessarily cause a problem um it can make a really big mess for things like you know the, the page tables and stuff on the on the processor but what you'll typically find is if you build the process or the sorry you build the software and you compile it under afl the first time without the you know memory sanitizations if you're on a 64-bit system um when you come to running the sanitizer over on it and you put an f address sanitizer it'll start moaning that it doesn't have enough memory um, now, what I do to be really cheap and make it work is just I literally push push dash M on AFL for memory, and I put like one twenty eight capital T to just say you know it's potentially up to one hundred twenty eight terabytes. Now my CPU is never going to use that much memory, but I just tell it that you know this is what it is because virtually it thinks it's got access to all of this memory when it doesn't actually have access to this memory. So that's one sort of notion. It will go a bit slower for many reasons, but um, it's a sort of a bit too complicated to talk about. But on to sort of generally how the, the sanitizer works. Um, you know, I, w I won't say exactly how this works because, you know, it changes all the time, but the, the brief idea is this. So whereas I said before and I demonstrated that, you know, we have some sort of buffer. We've got like a byte buffer here. Um, you know, like there was eight, eight, bits or, eight bits or one byte of memory. Um, we had like a one byte overread or a one byte overwrite and it didn't cause a crash. Well, what happens in the actual process memory is we have what's called shadow memory on the right hand side so basically the sanitizer builds a shadow or copy of not the memory itself but like the structure of the memory itself so this is the actual memory itself on the left hand side and it builds a shadow or a representation of the structure so you know it would it will just say that you know that this is a bit of stack memory you know, located at this position. It won't actually store any data in that stack memory, but it will just say that there is some memory here stored. And in the shadow memory, it keeps track of it. It's just like a tracing tool. And it puts, it generally puts these sort of guard, what it call guard pages or guard things on the outside. So, you know, this green thing in the middle is the representation for our actual underlying uh, buffer. And on the each side here, we put these two guards on each side that say, you know, if anything ever reads or writes into this location or something happens, trigger a crash. So whereas in this case here, you know, it wouldn't have crashed into just normal process memory because we've put this notion of a sanitizer shadow memory here. If we read or write outside those bounds, even by one byte, it'll actually crash. It will actually crash the process and, you know, it will, you know, do a, a display because it's actually marked out the structure of this memory. It doesn't actually 
record um like i said it doesn't actually copy the memory and physically you know in, in you know let's just draw this and let's just draw like a heap or something or we'll draw a stack right so this is a stack you know this might be your first variable stored this might be a second variable stored your third variable stored fourth variable stored and this is actually how your process will still run but at the same time you have a copy of the structure that says you know here is you know the, the first bit of that buffer the second bit the third bit and each time it puts these little guards in between it to recognize whether or not you can actually read or write into that location now there's lots of other tips and tricks that the sanitizers do but that's the sort of um genuine idea behind it and anyway that's sort of the end of my notes um i'm not quite sure if there's anything else i can go into um but you know important bits when i'm doing fuzzing sanitizers find smaller more niggly bugs there's still our bugs there's still our bugs and they need to work um they will cause the process to crash more often, generally. Um, but like I said, my approach is fuzz under something like AFL first without the sanitizers, then go back once those bugs are fixed. It might take a while, but at least you fix the major bugs first. Go back again. Um, you'll have some issues, potentially with some virtual memory problems and 64-bit processors. But go back again and, you know, uh, rebuild it. But we rebuild the sanitizers. And one, one important thing to note before I leave is this is generally a compile time approach. Now you could argue that you can detect this in, uh, you know, if you've only access to the binary. I mean, that's what Valgrind does, right? You, you, you know, it can it can detect certain things about the program running, and if it exceeds certain memory, there are certain tools. But generally, these sanitizers you have to compile them in, um, so you're not going to have as much of granular control with uh, finding bugs in software if you don't have access to the source code. I always recommend when you're looking for bugs, get access to the source code if you can. Generally. I would say this works for everyone, but generally, if someone's not willing to give you the source code um, for a test or whatever, it potentially means that they don't want to give it you because the source code isn't very good. Um, I've seen that quite a lot. Like, there's a lot of bugs in it, and they know it, so they don't want to give you the source code in the hopes that you can't find the bugs, um, which I wouldn't say is a necessarily good way of doing it. I'm not saying it's true for everyone, but I have seen my fair share of that happening. But what's really useful, um, I mean, but still... Like if you want to go after those things that have got more bugs in it, then you're probably going to have more of the major bugs. So, you know, when you're doing the, you know, fuzzing without source code, as I'll explain in the next lesson, um, you won't be, you know, you won't really necessarily care as much about these sanitizers. And hopefully, you know, if you find major bugs in it and, you know, Windows software, it will encourage people to at least with their um, auditors or with their pen testers to be a bit more open with source code because at the end of the day it's far more efficient to do it that way it's far more quicker and it's far better for everyone involved and far cheaper for everyone involved you know to take this you know more open approach because right you know black hat guys or you know actual malicious hackers have potentially months or years to attack this stuff and you know me as a pen tester or me as a vulnerability researcher is only paid for a week so like I've got to reduce that years long of work into one week and try and do the same as, you know, a potential malicious attacker could have. And one of my favorite things that people say to me is, oh, I'm not giving you the source code. I'm like, well, so I can I can pretty be sure that there might be some bugs in it because you won't give me the source code. Because, you know, how will if you if this is the approach you've taken with all of your developers oh sorry, with all of your people pen testing, then number one, they've just not been able to find the bugs in it yet because, you know, a lot of people can be quite obstructive. Or they're just scared that their source code is really bad. And, you know, I've seen both cases. And, you know, each time we found malicious books in it. We've exploited the books without access to the source code, which has been really nice. Anyway, just wanted to give you that on the notes. I will upload the notes at the same time, but uh, that's just one I wanted to go through.